Okay, so as I said earlier, the second indirect mechanism associated with myofiber hypertrophy is myonucleogenesis. Now, if you break down this term, you will see that this is a process in which there is a formation of new nuclei in the muscle fiber. Now, going back to basic physio days, you would know that muscle fibers are multinucleated, meaning they have multiple nuclei. And you can see this in this histological image right here. Now, this is a little different than the last images that I've shown you of muscle fiber samples. This is not a cross-sectional view, but a longitudinal view. You're looking at the muscle fiber sideways, or long ways, rather. And these glowing little ovals right here, these are stained myonuclei. Now, one of the reasons muscle fibers are multinucleated is that even at adulthood, new myonuclei can form. So myonuclear genesis, as it relates to myofiber hypertrophy, operates on the basis of the myonuclear domain theory. So what is a myonuclear domain? Let's go ahead and take a look at that definition right here. It is a single nucleus of the muscle fiber and the area that it controls on the muscle fiber. So it is a single nucleus on a muscle fiber and the specific area that it can control. This implies that a single myonucleus can only control a limited area of the muscle fiber and the muscle fiber can only expand so much before new nuclei have to be added to the muscle fiber for continued hypertrophy. So let's take this first figure on the left. We can see this muscle fiber cross section is separated into four areas, separated by this black border line. Now each of these four areas is a myonuclear domain controlled by a single nucleus denoted by these yellow ovals. Now imagine you are resistance training, adding that mechanical stress to the muscle continuously. We know from the prior slides as an adaptation to this repeated stress, there will be elevated myofibrillar protein synthesis within the fiber. And this will cause the fiber to hypertrophy or expand as you can see right here. Now, say you are continuously training, adding stress, and the muscle fibers want to continue to adapt by synthesizing more myofibular proteins. Well, at this point, each of these four nuclei cannot control any further area of the fiber, meaning each of the myonuclear domains have reached its capacity. So in order to support further protein synthesis and further hypertrophy of the fiber, additional myonuclei and thus myonuclear domains must be added to the muscle fiber to support further myofibular protein synthesis and therefore hypertrophy. Now, as you can see, myonuclear genesis is not directly contributing to hypertrophy. It is allowing for a greater capacity for hypertrophy via protein synthesis. And thus it is normal for those who resistance train to have elevated levels of myonuclei on their muscle fibers compared to pre-training or those who don't resistance train at all. So the next question is, where does this additional myonuclei come from? It comes from specialized muscle stem cells called satellite cells. Now these cells are called satellite cells because they hang out on the edges of the muscle fiber sandwiched right between the two outer membrane layers. And these satellite cells are dormant, meaning they're inactive. What this also means is that there needs to be some kind of stimulus to activate these satellite cells. So what are the different stimuli for satellite cells? As you can see listed here, you have multiple stimuli for satellite cell activation, and they are all somewhat related to resistance training. For example, muscle damage, hormones like testosterone and growth factors like insulin, like growth factor one or IGF-1, and most importantly, mechanotransduction. What is mechanotransduction? This is a process in which a mechanical stressor like elevated muscle tension is turned into a signal that the muscle fiber can detect. And that signal is transduced to a biochemical signal, which in turn stimulates not only things like protein synthesis, but also stimulates these satellite cells, waking them up. So what happens when these satellite cells wake up? 
Well, in summary, they multiply or proliferate and eventually donate their nucleus to the muscle fiber and thus the muscle fiber gains new nuclei and new myelonuclear domains. This figure here represents this process. Now, one of the key points you must remember as indicated down here to the bottom right is that this process of satellite cell activation and nuclei donation is primarily for the purpose of repairing muscle fiber damage. And it is only after the damage is repaired can this process contribute to increasing the capacity for myofiber hypertrophy. So let's go through the sequence of this process of myonuclear genesis. Let's start on top. The blue ovals represent myonuclei and the green ovals represent the satellite cells with its single nucleus, as you can see here. Now there is a stimulus, as I listed before. Let's just say the stimulus is muscle damage after a heavy exercise bout. This would wake up the satellite cells and in so doing, the satellite cells will multiply or in other words, proliferate. When damage is present on the muscle fiber, the satellite cells will travel or chemotaxi to the damaged site of the muscle fiber and through a process called differentiation, the satellite cells fuse to the muscle fiber and become part of the muscle fiber. And in so doing, the satellite cells donate its nucleus. Now, as I said before, this process can happen even in the absence of damage. So once damage is repaired, the satellite cells can be activated in the same way here in response to mechanotransduction, for example, and it can donate its nucleus to the muscle fiber. And thus the number of nuclei on the muscle fiber is increased. So this is happening during resistance training. Now on a side note, remember how I said one factor that might contribute to muscle growth is hyperplasia, which is the formation of new muscle fibers. And like I said, this is not too substantiated in humans, but we have studied it in animals. And one way hyperplasia may work is also through the satellite cells in that the satellite cells can fuse together to form a premature muscle fiber called a myotube. And eventually that mild tube can become a mature muscle fiber. So this is the general mechanism of hyperplasia. So in summary, during resistance training, satellite cells can become active in response to mechanical stress imposed by lifting weights, and they can donate their nucleus to the muscle fiber. This would add more myonuclei to the fiber and thereby myonuclear domains, which increases the capacity for the muscle fiber to hypertrophy via myofibular protein synthesis. Now, if you click on the link down here, you can see satellite cells activated in real time via an electron microscope, uh, which is basically a powerful microscope. Now, we've all heard of this concept of muscle memory, but recently with the latest evidence in exercise physiology, there's sort of a new take on this concept of muscle memory. Now, there's been a number of studies that have shown a retraining effect that may suggest some sort of muscle memory. Now, here's a study that demonstrates this effect. Now, subjects engaged in resistance training for 10 weeks. Now, during these 10 weeks, they experience a significant increase in muscle mass and strength as one would expect, as you can see by this red and yellow line. Then subjects stopped training or detrained for 20 weeks straight, during which time most of the adaptations achieved in the first 10 weeks of training was completely lost. Then during just five weeks of retraining, which is half the time of the initial training phase, subjects recuperated all their lost gains almost 100%. They experienced gains within five weeks that initially took 10 weeks to achieve during the initial phase. So research evidence shows that the muscle in response to a period of prior adaptation to training holds some kind of memory, so to speak, of this prior adaptation in that even after a period of detraining and de-adaptation, the muscle quote unquote may remember prior history of adaptation, and the muscle may be primed for re-adaptation and recuperating lost gains. Now, this is all in theory at this point, but there is some evidence to suggest that this may in part have to do with myonuclei. For example, during the initial training period, there was an increase in myonuclear genesis and thus myonuclei accretion, as discussed earlier.
Now, during the detraining period, the myonuclei number may have remained elevated. And thus, during the retraining period, there was an elevated capacity for muscle hypertrophy that was not present before the initial training period. Now, this study showed very little contributions of myonuclei on this retraining effect, but others have shown myonuclei to play a role in this retraining effect. Now, other studies have shown that the muscle cells within its nuclei, more specifically DNA, can undergo changes in response to training. This is referred to as epigenetics, which is a change in gene expression without a change in genotype. Think of it simply as switching on and off genes in response to some kind of external stressor like exercise. So genes that have some role in muscle hypertrophy or adaptation to training may have been altered in its expression during the initial training period and this change is sustained during the detraining period and thus during the retraining period there is a quote unquote memory of prior training and adaptation and this may contribute to a faster rate of adaptation in a retraining period now the practical implications of this evidence include situations of injury and rehab or even periods in which one takes a break from training now for the sake of time i went ahead and skipped the last two slides as the information on there is purely for your information and unnecessary for the quiz so in summary of myonuclear genesis in response to resistance training there is increased myonuclei formation not only to repair damaged muscle fibers but also to add myonuclear domains which would increase the capacity for myofiber hypertrophy now these myonuclei come from satellite cells so satellite cells contribute to the capacity for myofiber hypertrophy. Now, just like all processes in the body, there is tight regulation of satellite cell activity. We know the stimuli for satellite cells like mechanical stress, but what about the inhibitors of satellite cells? Now, the primary inhibitor of satellite cells is myostatin. Statins are chemicals that inhibit something, and given that myo refers to muscle, Myostatin is a hormone-like molecule that inhibits muscle growth via inhibition of satellite cells. Myostatin is the primary satellite cell inhibitor. We all have myostatin, and there's only been one known case of myostatin deficiency in humans. But in animals, as shown in this breed of cattle right here, there is a genetic mutation that was discovered that results in myostatin deficiency. And you can clearly see the effects of that on the whole body musculature. As you can see, this breed of cattle dubbed Belgian Blue is unusually muscular. And in a study of Belgian Blue in what is dubbed as the double muscle study, researchers found that this breed of cattle are deficient in myostatin. What does this mean? Well, if myostatin is absent in this organism, then there is no inhibitor of satellite cell activity. So you can imagine satellite cells of their muscles uncontrollably being active, leading to a very large capacity for muscle hypertrophy, even in the absence of resistance training or some type of mechanical stress to their muscle. Now in a separate animal study, in a rodent model study, as shown to the left, researchers manipulated the mice in a couple ways to study myostatin. First, as shown in the middle column here, you can see it labeled as negative activin R2B. This stands for negative activin receptor 2B. This is the receptor that myostatin binds to on the satellite cells to inhibit the satellite cell. So negative activin receptor 2B simply means that these mice were genetically modified to not express this receptor on their satellite cells or on their muscle. So they have myostatin, but the myostatin cannot inhibit satellite cells because they do not have a receptor for myostatin to bind to. And what is the result of all this? As you can see, this group of mice, the muscle size and mass is clearly greater than the control mice. This is of course in the absence of any training stressor or mechanical stressor to the muscle, meaning the muscle growth occurred in these mice simply at rest. Now in a separate group of mice, a chemical called folostatin was administered. Folostatin is a myostatin blocker in that it blocks myostatin from binding to the active end receptor. And thus myostatin cannot inhibit satellite cells because folostatin is blocking it from binding to its receptor. 
And just like the other group of mice here, there is a tremendous level of muscle growth. So what is the importance of these experiments in the human model? Well, there are clear clinical implications as it relates to the treatment of diseases characterized by muscle wasting or degeneration like muscular dystrophy, cachexia, which is muscle wasting associated with cancer or disease states, sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting associated with aging, and other myopathies, which is just a general term for muscle diseases, which are usually characterized by degeneration of the muscle tissue. So with that said, despite some compelling evidence on myostatin inhibition via chemicals like folostatin, there is currently no FDA approved drug treatment that is a myostatin inhibitor. There were much concerns with safety as well as potential abuse. So these myostatin inhibiting drugs did not pass all stages of clinical trials precluding FDA approval. Now, regardless, of course, you will have shady supplement companies like such put out products that claim to be myostatin inhibitors. There is no myostatin inhibitor currently on the market. If it was, it would not be sold as a dietary supplement or being sold at your local supplement shop. It would be manufactured and sold as an FDA approved pharmaceutical drug. So please be smart if at any time you are introduced to something claimed to be a myostatin inhibitor. Just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so far we've covered the neural adaptations to resistance training as well as the muscular adaptations. And you can see they both contribute to the overarching adaptation of neuromuscular strength development. So let's talk about the time courses for each of these adaptations, the neural and the muscular adaptations. So to lay the foundation for this discussion, think back to when you first started to lift weights or your first set of push-ups or pull-ups. Now my first time really getting into resistance training was my freshman year of high school. I was on the football team and as part of the off-season training, we all had to lift weights. I remember getting onto that bench press over ambitiously putting on 45s on each side and I just remember the bar just slamming right into my chest as soon as I unracked it. So I took the weights off and I remember I had to just start with only the bar. The bar was heavy to me and the movement was so slow and so uncontrolled. But after a couple weeks of benching the bar, I remember putting a quarter on each side, then 35s and eventually 45s in only just a matter of several weeks. In other words, I saw a pretty sharp increase in strength in just the first three weeks of benching. Now, when I think about that time, this increase in strength did not really accompany any changes in my muscle size and mass, meaning I did not experience any observable changes in muscle size and mass with this initial strength development. So how do we explain this? So in response to a new resistance exercise stressor, the initial improvements in strength is mainly attributed to neural adaptations and some minor contributions from muscular adaptations. Now this doesn't mean muscular adaptations are not occurring in this initial phase. There is indeed increased myofibrillar protein synthesis and myofiber hypertrophy happening but it is not pronounced enough to have a large contribution to strength development, at least initially. It is also not pronounced enough to manifest in observable changes in muscle tissue size and mass. Remember, we are talking about molecular and cellular level changes that influence changes at the tissue level. There needs to be sufficient changes at the molecular and cellular level to actually be able to see or observe changes at the tissue level. It's like, adding a grain of sand to a container of sand. Yes, technically the container of sand has increased the mass, but is it observable? No, it's not. So observable muscle growth takes time because the increased protein synthesis and myofiber hypertrophy resulting from that is just too small initially to be observable at the whole tissue level. So major contributions of muscular adaptations to strength development is a bit delayed compared to neural adaptations. This is typically when you start to experience observable changes in muscle tissue size and mass. So again, initially, neural adaptations contribute primarily to the strength development and towards the latter portions of the resistance training program, muscle hypertrophy or muscular adaptations become a major contributor to the strength development. So to put some estimated values to all this, say within eight weeks of unaccustomed resistance training, during the first two weeks, 90% of the strength gains are attributable to neural adaptations with just a small contribution from muscular adaptations, i.e. myofibrillar protein synthesis and the resulting myofiber hypertrophy. 
This is again when myofibrillar protein synthesis is starting to ramp up and some myofibrillar hypertrophy has occurred, but not to a point where it can be observed at the tissue level, nor have it become a major contributor to strength development. So as you develop strength and become adapted to the resistance training program, the rate of neural adaptations decrease and around four weeks, muscle hypertrophy has reached a significant degree in which it is contributing largely to strength gains. And this is the point where you may start to experience observable changes in muscle size and mass. Again, just because you don't see changes in your muscle size and mass doesn't mean myofibrillar protein synthesis and myofibrillar hypertrophy is not occurring. So do not think that muscular adaptations don't contribute to strength development in the initial phases of resistance training. It does, but not as much as neural adaptations. Now, as you can see towards the tail end of the training period, the rate of neural and muscular adaptations start to level off. Remember what we said in the beginning of this lecture series. As you adapt to the mechanical stressor, the stressor becomes less stressful over time and thus the stimulus for adaptation diminishes. So this plateau in neural and muscular adaptations and thus the plateau in strength development simply indicates that there is no longer sufficient mechanical stress to elicit further adaptation because your neuromuscular system has sufficiently adapted to the resistance training stressor. So what does this imply? There is a need for some type of change in your program to provide a new stressor to stimulate further adaptation. More on this towards the end of this lecture series. Okay, so for some basic recap questions, which two factors contribute to strength development? We have neural adaptations and we have muscular or skeletal muscle adaptations. What are the neural adaptations contributing to strength improvement? We have positive changes in motor unit recruitment, more specifically, motor unit recruitment efficiency. We have increased firing rate or frequency, and we also have increased synchronization of motor unit activation. How does muscle or myofiber hypertrophy occur? Well, the muscle fibers expand or hypertrophy during resistance training due to increased rate of myofibrillar protein synthesis. In so doing, because you are putting more stuff inside the muscle fiber, the muscle fiber is going to expand or hypertrophy. And over time, when there are significant amounts of hypertrophy, the muscle tissue mass will increase. Now, the second mechanism underpinning muscle fiber hypertrophy is myonuclear genesis. This is not a direct contributor to hypertrophy. It only increases the capacity for muscle fibers to hypertrophy. And it does that through the formation of new myonuclei. This leads into the next question. What role do satellite cells play in hypertrophy? It is what donates the nuclei to the muscle fiber, increasing the myonuclei number of the muscle fiber, increasing the myonuclear domain number. Strength gain during the first two to four weeks of resistance training is primarily due to neural adaptations. Again, this doesn't mean muscular adaptations is not happening. It's just that the muscular adaptations, i.e. myofibrillar protein synthesis and hypertrophy, is not sufficient enough to be a primary contributor to strength development. Only through time when there is significant amounts of muscular adaptations, which usually manifest in observable changes in muscle tissue mass, this is when it becomes a significant contributor to strength development. So kind of switching gears here, I want to discuss neuromuscular strength in a bit more detail in that strength is a more generalized term to describe the general functional capacity of the neuromuscular system in the context of movement. But strength can be expressed in multiple ways, and we can see this clearly in the athletic population. What I mean by this is that strength is not just simply how much weight you can lift in a particular exercise, although that's a very simplistic way to look at strength. Rather, strength can be expressed in several general ways, which we call strength attributes. We know there are athletes that are explosive and fast, like a sprinter or a running back. We also have athletes who may not be explosive or fast, but can produce tons of force, such as a powerlifter or a strongman competitor. We also have athletes who may not have super high force producing capacity, but they can produce elevated muscular forces continuously for an extended period of time, such as competitive rowers or cyclists. So all these athletes have comparatively high levels of neuromuscular strength, but the strength is expressed in different ways, meaning each of these athletes have different strength attributes. 
These different strength attributes are largely driven by two major factors. One, the way you train, which is the modifiable factor, and two, their genetic makeup or genotype, which is a non-modifiable factor. Keep in mind the genetic factors determine the capacity by which one would be able to develop a certain strength attribute, meaning anyone can train like a sprinter and develop explosive strength, but genetics will limit how much you would be able to achieve explosive strength. This means not everyone is born to be an elite sprinter. So with that said, resistance training programming should be predicated on which strength attribute is desired. Now, as you can see, muscle growth or hypertrophy is not listed here as a strength attribute because it is not. Muscle hypertrophy, more specifically the myofibrillar protein synthesis contributing to it, is an adaptation that simply contributes to strength development. That means you could achieve hypertrophy with programs tailored towards any one of these strength attributes. We see this with those athletes mentioned earlier that represent each of these strength attributes. All of them achieve some elevated level of muscle growth despite having such distinct resistance training programs and despite having distinct strength attributes. Why? Because increased myofibrillar protein synthesis and thus myofiber hypertrophy and in time muscle growth is simply a response to mechanical stress which can be afforded through so many different types of resistance training programs. Programs tailored to developing specific max strength, programs tailored specifically to developing power or explosive strength, and programs tailored towards developing endurance strength all provide mechanical stress to the muscle. So with that, strength development is not independent of muscle growth, which a lot of people think is the case. Many people ask me, how do I train just to achieve muscle growth and not strength? And that to me is nonsensical because it implies both are mutually independent processes where in fact, as we know by now, muscle hypertrophy as underpinned by increased myofibrillar protein synthesis is what partly contributes to strength development. Now the question is, does the amount of muscular adaptations or hypertrophy dictate which strength attribute you would achieve? So say we have two athletes of equal muscle mass. One is an Olympic lifter and the other is a power lifter. Now, despite having equal muscle mass, we know that these two athletes have very different strength attributes because they train differently in a goal specific manner. The Olympic lifter would express explosive strength because his training is tailored towards that specific strength attribute, while the power lifter expresses more uh, max specific strength because this athlete's training is tailored towards that particular strength attribute. So what type of adaptations to these goal specific training programs drive the development of a specific strength attribute? Well, it's not muscular adaptations. These two athletes have the same muscle mass. It is the neural adaptations that drive the development of specific strength attributes with uh, specific training programs. Meaning depending on the way you train, the nervous system can adapt in a way to elicit a specific strength attribute. So as you can see, the way you resistance train can dictate the way strength development is expressed. This means resistance training programs must be modified according to the desired strength attribute. How does one go about doing that? Well, years of exercise science research has shown that manipulation of what we call modifiable or acute training variables can influence the type of strength characteristic one would achieve. Now the modifiable or acute training variables shown to exert some impact on strength development is as follows. Type of exercise, order of exercise, number of sets and reps together making up volume, rest period, and intensity or load. An assignment of these training variables should be based on the specific strength goal. Now, after years of ongoing research, general guidelines have been formulated based on the evidence that is available. And so over the years, we have these textbook guidelines for resistance training programming based on specific goals. Now, keep in mind, however, this is a general guideline and should be used simply as a starting point. It is really important to continue modifying the program according to objective and subjective feedback as you train. So you can see the three strength attributes here. On top, this is maximum specific strength. Below that we have power or explosive strength. 
and at the very bottom we have endurance strength. And you can see the general resistance training program guidelines are very distinct across each of the strength attributes. We also see hypertrophy here, and like I said, it is not a strength attribute, and that hypertrophy is not independent of strength development. I also said that hypertrophy can be achieved with programs that are tailored towards any one of these strength attributes. However, these numbers here for intensity and volume, specifically sets and reps, are again just a guideline to suggest that you can perhaps optimize hypertrophy within these ranges for each training variable. However, these types of guidelines sort of give off a false perception that hypertrophy can only be achieved within the specific intensity range. Again, that is not the case. Hypertrophy is a response to repeated mechanical stress, which can be achieved through, for example, really heavy training to really light training. And the evidence in the research does demonstrate this. So let's take a look at this figure on the left. As shown in the table in the prior slide, muscle hypertrophy has traditionally been limited to a relatively small intensity range of 67 to 85% of 1RM, which equates roughly to 8 to 12 reps max per set. However, recent research provides a fresh perspective on this, as I mentioned earlier, and this is represented by the figure down here. Now we see in research that muscle hypertrophy may be achieved with intensities as low as 30% 1RM versus higher intensities of equal volume load. Volume load uh, equals load times total reps. So when you go with lighter intensities, there needs to be an increase in volume or total reps to achieve similar adaptations in terms of muscle hypertrophy as a higher intensity with lower volume. So think of this traditional range of 67 to 85% as sort of a sweet spot, but you do not need to be limited to this range to achieve muscle hypertrophy. You also have to keep in mind that people in the context of hypertrophy respond differently to different intensities. Some people see better gains with lower intensities and higher volume versus others who see maximal gains with really high intensities and lower volume. This is why these numbers are just guidelines and why modifications according to individual feedback is really important. It's not one intensity fits all kind of a situation when it comes to muscle growth. Again, this is irrespective of strength attribute development. This is simply in the context of muscle growth. Really all you need is sufficient mechanical stress and modifications to progressively increase intensity or some characteristic of the training program so that you can continuously adapt. And just for some bottom line points here, muscle hypertrophy and strength are not mutually exclusive as I emphasized earlier, meaning you can't just train for muscle hypertrophy. Muscle hypertrophy, more specifically, the elevated myofibular protein synthesis is an adaptation to resistance training that contributes to the overarching adaptation of strength development. Now, I also decided to outline some key points for muscle growth, um, and this is evidence-based key points. So number one, low and high rep schemes are similarly effective for building muscle growth. So it really just depends on what works for you. So paying attention to individual feedback and progression is very, very important. Like I said, some people respond favorably in terms of muscle growth to higher intensities and some to moderate intensities and some to lower intensities. And some people just respond similarly across the entire spectrum of intensities. Second, loads should be moved with maximal effort as fast as possible concentrically, especially lighter loads. Why? Recruitment of type two muscle fibers with maximum effort lifts. It's not just the weight that you're lifting that dictates the recruitment of type two muscle fibers. It is how you lift that weight. So if you're doing lighter loads and you're just lifting with uh, sub-maximal effort, you may not be recruiting those type two muscle fibers which have the greatest capacity for hypertrophy. So to make sure, especially with lighter loads, that you are effectively recruiting these type two muscle fibers, you want to give maximum effort, lift it as fast as possible. So these fibers, again, have a greater capacity for hypertrophy than your type ones. Third, for eccentric contractions, and we'll go over this in a couple slides here, force and muscular tension or mechanical stress is not maximized by simply moving a weight voluntarily slow eccentrically. This is a misconception that many people have. 
lot of people do slow negatives and um, very slow repetitions, for example. Force, tension, and thus mechanical stress is maximized during an eccentric contraction. When contracting maximally against the load, you cannot move concentrically. We'll discuss this a little bit in the next uh, few slides here. Four, training to failure. Reps to failure for each set is unnecessary. Why? By fatiguing the muscles, you reduce the level of force, tension, and therefore mechanical stress. So you are reducing the quality of your overall training bout by training to failure every single set. Five, complex variations are not necessary. You do not need to always keep your muscles guessing, quote unquote, by excessive exercise variety. Simple progressive overload will work. For example, just lifting a little bit heavier or lifting more volume or changing your technique a little bit and possibly changing the type of exercise but don't change it so much that it's highly varied from your original exercise. So you don't need to be too complex. You do not need to keep your muscles guessing to maximize muscle growth. Six, no single exercise is mandatory for muscle growth. Remember, increased myofibular protein synthesis and therefore muscle hypertrophy is simply an adaptation to continuous mechanical stress. If a leg extension provides the same mechanical stress to the quads as a squat, then it will provide an equal stimulus for MPS and hypertrophy, at least conceivably. So there really is no best exercise uh, for muscle hypertrophy. It is whatever can provide a sufficient mechanical stress to the muscle of interest, to the target muscle. Now this slide is on eccentric overloading, which we went over in our first lecture series, so I won't spend too much time on this. But just to reiterate the main points, eccentric overloading is not simply moving the weights in the eccentric action intentionally slow. This would actually reduce the amount of force and thereby tension and thereby mechanical stress to the muscle. It's about maximum effort eccentric contractions, which means you are contracting as hard as possible against an external load that you cannot move concentrically. So this means using techniques like cheat reps or having a partner help you with the concentric portion of the lift or using unilateral exercises. For example, if you want to do eccentric overloading on the leg press, use bilateral, both legs, for the concentric portion and use unilateral or one leg during the eccentric portion. Eccentric overloading can be a great tool for you to use to maximize neuromuscular adaptations due to the relatively high amounts of mechanical tension and thereby stress it can provide. So this is according to the force velocity curve, which again, we went over in the first lecture series. Now, as a final topic of discussion in this lecture series, I want to talk about the concept of progressive overload, which is an important training principle to understand if you want to overcome training plateaus. Now, progressive overload is based on the general adaptation syndrome, which describes the stages an organism, like us, undergo in response to an external stress and repeated stress. So let's adapt the general adaptation syndrome to neuromuscular responses to resistance training. First, we have the alarm phase. In this phase, the overload stressor is imposed on the neuromuscular system. This can be represented by an unaccustomed bout of resistance exercise. This is what the term overload implies, meaning your neuromuscular system is unfamiliar with this stressor. That's why it is a stress. And we said the specific stress in relation to resistance training and adaptation to it is mechanical stress. So this induces a temporary or immediate decline in neuromuscular function or strength. And this is referred to as shock. This can be characterized by a temporary decrease in strength and perhaps soreness. Typically, this is the time when the muscles undergo damage as well. After the shock is resolved, the neuromuscular system returns to baseline levels. And this return to baseline is called compensation, which is part of the adaptation phase of the general adaptation syndrome. Now, once the adaptations exceed baseline, this is when one would experience strength development. This is referred to as supercompensation. Supercompensation is a general term to describe net gains. So strength supercompensation really just means strength gains. 
And so strength supercompensation during this adaptation phase is underpinned by those neural and muscular adaptations we talked about in this lecture series. Now eventually we would enter a plateau phase in which supercompensation stops. What does this represent? This point of plateau simply means you have sufficiently adapted to the initial overload stress. And in so doing, that initial overload stress is no longer an overload stress to your neuromuscular system, meaning the neuromuscular system has adequately adapted to the mechanical stress and thus at this point, the mechanical stress has diminished to a level in which there is no longer a stimulus for further adaptation. So what should you do to overcome the plateau? Just think simply. From a conceptual standpoint, you need to introduce a new mechanical stress by changing something about your training program. You can do this simply by increasing intensity, volume, or both. Or like I said earlier, you can add some variation to the exercises you have been doing to add some type of challenge. This is where manipulation of the modifiable acute training variables would be appropriate. So if I ask the question, when should progressive overload be implemented, it is when supercompensation ceases. Now another question I might ask is, during which part of the general adaptation syndrome would neural and muscular adaptations take place, resulting in net strength gains? This would be supercompensation. Supercompensation is synonymous with adaptation. So in principle, in order to achieve neuromuscular adaptations, you must give your body a reason to change, meaning you need to give a stimulus for adaptation, which in this case is mechanical stress. So over repeated bouts of the initial mechanical stressor, the stimulus for adaptation will diminish as you adapt to it. And thus, eventually, there will be no more adaptation because there is no more reason for the neuromuscular system to continually increase in strength. So this is the point where you must consider applying new overload stressors since the original stressor is no longer an overload stress. This is the basis for progressive overloading. You must think of unique ways to progressively increase tension as you adapt. So when progressive overload is properly implemented, you will see something like this as it relates to general adaptation syndrome. When a new overload stress is applied, the whole cycle continues while you continuously increase neuromuscular strength. As you can see, the phases of the general adaptation syndrome are re-established, but just at a higher level of strength because you added an overload stressor that is progressive from the initial overload stressor. So as a lay interpretation of progressive overload, um, a simplistic take would be everything works, but nothing works forever. Having a large variety of training methods to use for short periods and continually cycling them in a systematic order will prevent stagnation and maximize training adaptations towards your desired goals. Okay, so this concludes our lecture series on the basic science of neuromuscular strength development. Now I will say for the sake of converting this lecture series to an online format, I have abbreviated a number of discussions in this lecture series. So I did leave things out. So if you have any questions or want to learn more about this topic, please feel free to contact me. I'm always willing to talk further with my students about any topic if they desire to learn more information.